Hello and welcome to a new Luna Lua tutorial. Today's episode is going to be completely theoretical as I am going to delve in into ways in which you can make your code more organized and more performant and just generally easier for you and other people to read. I have prepared a selection of cases which are some common uh, flaws I find in both my own and other people's code and which I try to correct when I can try to suggest a correction for. So I want to go through these one by one and as I go through I want to make changes to them to show how they might be better and how you might like having them. So our first case just has a an attempt at a boss object drafted up with some zero values just to show it with a boss that moves right and down and on tick uh, as he does. He would of course also be drawn further below, but the thing I'm focusing on is this slew of variables which are all not connected in any way other than name. So this is of course a very um, minor example of this. Of course you could also have nondescript variable names like this, where it's just okay good, but what does the frame belong to? You would have to scroll down and find out for yourself. One thing I like to do for uh, these kinds of uh, instances is to group these variables together into a table, which I can just call boss, which will then get an x coordinate, which will get an y coordinate, and then you wouldn't need this slew of variables up here, but rather could just use boss.x and boss.y. Now, uh, one thing that might be silly to some people. If I add the frame and frame speed back into this, if it were just some regular object, a self-made NPC for example, purely defined through code, then it might be silly uh, to specify stuff like the priority or the frame or the frame speed in the constructor every time, especially if we want multiple of those. And this is where I want to introduce the variable type that I had omitted in the variables tutorial because it is a little bit more subtle as a variable. We have however used it in the past already and I'm going to show you right now what it is. We can create a function called NPC creator that gives us back an NPC and in here we can put all of this and figure out what of this we want to um, specify per NPC. Uh, assuming this is all a single ID, so to speak, a single kind of NPC, it would of course only make sense to specify the X and Y coordinates directly. Then we wouldn't have to bother ourselves with all of these because those will be the same either way. We would uh, then return the NPC, which would uh, make it come back out of the function and then we could make a npc object that is npc creator at position zero zero this will give us our own npc run through this function give us the result back and then we can use it in on tick in order to manipulate it if we have multiple of these there's one thing you might notice it's that this line is called multiple times so in this sense it does make sense to make a npc image variable which is distinct for, from the npc itself and just extract that out into its own thing. If the image is used for several things we can still specify it as part of this table, however we can also just access npc image directly when we try to draw the image. It makes it much easier to make multiple ones of your uh, object and it avoids needless code duplication where we specify priority frame and frame speed as the same thing every time. Now moving on to case 2. This one is one which you might have run into yourself due to my own carelessness in uh, previous tutorials because I never fully addressed this statement. What the return statement does as we have seen before is it breaks out of a function with uh, here with nothing but you can specify something it returns with. On draw, of course, doesn't use any of that, but in this case, what would happen is if inactive is set to true, the function would 
not draw anything beyond here. Um, now, what if we wanted to skip the first draw call but still have the second one? This would of course not work out for us. The simplest way to turn that around is to say if not inactive to have the inverse of the if statement and then just encapsulate it like this. In that sense uh, we would have our code uh, draw just as we want to every time. It's a simple fix. I wanted to address it in detail in order to avoid any unnecessary confusion I might have caused in previous tutorials. Moving on to case 3. This one uh, takes something from the player manipulation tutorial a little bit. The if statements are in a particular order. Now, one thing about if statements is that when the if statement notices that it has to combine the several things with AND together, it will just give up as soon as it hits a roadblock. So uh, in order to check the least things, you uh, usually want to put the easiest checks for the program to figure out first. The easiest checks being your own variables. So when it comes down to it, the Turning this if statement around to check for not input locked before anything else is actually faster than it would be the other way around. Another thing you can do is you can order them in a way where the less likely checks like player.keys.jump are put in front so that whenever that's not true the program doesn't even have to check for these other ones. A simple rearrangement which if you are starting to work with more complicated arrangements of if statements, can make a difference. Here is case 4, which is similar to case 1, in that we have four separately defined objects, which are in a way similar. Now, these objects already are begging to be part of a table, so we can make a local object table. These are very non-descriptive objects. And then we can loop over them for i equals 1, 4, this is how many we want, do, and then we can create a local object and then call table.insert object table. Now, uh, of course, this isn't quite what we had down there uh, because this is all a1 and b2. We have here 1, 2, 3, 4, and 2, 4, 6, 8 in the a and b columns, respectively. The simple thing to notice, however, is that these are all related. So, um, in fact, we can use the iterator variable of the for loop, which will be 1 on the first iteration, 2 on the second, 3 on the third, 4 on the fourth, in order to fill these in. We can use i, which is equivalent to 1 times i, of course. You can take the 1 times away, but I'm going to keep it in for uh, clarity's sake, and 2 times i which uh, will be 1, 2, 3, 4 and 2, 4, 6, 8 respectively. So we have the same objects with the same scaling and instead of having to do an object 5 with a 5 and 10 in order to upscale this, the only thing we need to do is we need to change this to a 5 in order to change the amount of objects we will have in total. If we then access object table of an index, we can take the a variable or the B variable from it very easily. Furthermore, uh, having them all in a table allows us to loop over them directly, which might be handy for larger groups of objects that should be all handled in bulk. Case 5 is similar to this. However, as you can see, the numbers are not in order. This one is more similar to case 1 because it cannot be generalized into a for loop. So what I would do is create a function. First we create the same object table because these are just begging to be grouped together. We call it object maker with A and B in which we can return a new table, which is our object. I'm going to short shorthand it a little bit. This is functionally the same as if I put this and then return to object. It does the same thing. And then we can again 
can do table.insert uh, object table and then we can insert object maker with the 12 and 84 as well as 2, 12, 0 and 38, 11, 0. The benefit of course of always being that we can now loop over these similar objects instead of handling all of them separately since they all are similar in nature. Moving on to case 6, this case is a tiny bit different and handles code duplication in a way, where as you can see the 84 times math.sign luna time tick times 0.05 is something that is present in all three lines. If you ever notice like some complex operation, this is of course not very complex, but uh, this is like the nature of how you might see it, even across multiple lines. You can extract it into a local variable, uh, an offset is this in this case, and if you define it and on tick, the local variable will be discarded by the end. Using uh, this offset variable, we can then replace all of this, and uh, the benefit is that if we wanted to change this from 84 to, say, 48, we would only need to change it in this location, uh, rather than changing it in every line here by itself. There is one more uh, thing we can improve here, maybe you have already seen it, and uh, as we have seen up there, there was a pattern in how the objects were manipulated. Here, the objects have a coordinate which is similar. We can see that the coordinate is 200,600, but then offset by 200. So what we can do for a object in iPairs. Uh, I'm gonna call this O because uh, we don't want variables to be called the same. We can say O the object at key K for example 1, 2, 3. There are currently three objects in there. Dot X is minus 200,400 minus 200 times K to perform that operation plus offset, which will, for k being 1 at the first object, give us this value, because 200 times 1 is minus 200 times 1 is minus 200, which will be added to this, being minus 200,600, then 800, then 201,000, making the code much simpler and more compact as well as well as making it more robust if we were to add a fourth object which were to follow the same pattern. Of course we can also change this to run in a for loop since we are not currently manipulating x in any way. Case 7 is a similar case which needs to be approached slightly differently. We can no longer unify this statement over here, but instead in order to unify these objects we need to get a little bit more crafty because what seems to have been done here is that the object is not sufficiently filled. There are more variables it depends on than what it seems to like. It seems to only have an x coordinate but it also has the starting position, the amplitude and the frequency amplitude being the size of the sine wave which is simulated here as well as the frequency which is the speed at which it oscillates. So we would add a source x variable, a amplitude and a frequency variable and then we could use these values, build them in here and now we have our values part of the object definitions. Of course if we wanted to, we could extract all of this again into a function uh, where we specify the source x, amplitude, and frequency. Don't need the x coordinate because it's set in our ontic. We can then, of course, again loop over our objects. Let me just copy this here. And it's going to look similar but not identical because this time we will make use of the other variables in our object type source x plus 
amplitude times math dot sign not time times frequency which will give us uh, exactly what we want for each object except of course I need to specify that object dot source X object of amplitude and object frequency since they're part of the object this will give us for object 1 the source X of minus 200,600 with an amplitude of 86 frequency of 0 0.12 and the other variables respective for the other objects allowing us to have similar objects do similar things with vastly different configurations which is also very handy to have in various situations. Our last case concerns itself more with performance than with a neatening of the code and is a very important case in general. There are some costly operations in code sometimes which if you are using the profiler with the F3 key, if I just save like this and show it to you, if we were to use the profiler, we could see the graph of how much performance is used up. If we press F3 again, we can see what part of Lua code is using up all of this. When you notice your own code being in any of these near the top, one thing you might want to do is take a look at the line number over here and if it's something that is a very costly operation you might want to figure out if you can make it so that it is called less. One of these very costly operations is block.get which will return all blocks in your level. Now in this scenario which is a little bit construed uh, we loop over these blocks and then check for an ID. You can use the ID check preemptively in order to exclude all blocks of another ID, which might be a really good solution if you have very few blocks of that ID in your level. However, there is a better way to go about it in this scenario, which is due to this check over here. This check checks for the coordinates of the blocks, which is something that we can make use of and push over here into the block.get by turning it into a block.get intersecting which will take the four corners of the box in which we want to check which would be cam.x, cam.y, cam.x plus cam.width as well as cam.y plus cam.height giving us the entire screen space which we had previously checked over here. This of course will give us a list of blocks in that screen space and now we have much less blocks we are looping over and just immediately discarding. There is more things we can improve here though. One is that there are two types of uh, iterator modes for for loops, which I hadn't previously touched upon, which are pairs and I pairs. There is a key difference between the two that in that I pairs assumes that the table is ordered so that there is an index 1, then an index 2, then an index 3, then an index 4, which is always true for these get intersecting or get operations. If there are gaps, then you need to use pairs. However, this is not the case in this case, and we will have an ordered list which will be a faster operation on i pairs. Then we can check for the ID and we can also make sure that the get intersecting is called less if we pull the death timer out because we do not need to check this for each block individually but only in order to figure out whether any of this code should run in the first place. So if we take this out then we have a layer before the blocks are intersecting. This is in principle similar to the if statement ordering in that we are performing an operation first before checking uh, the more expensive ones, which will lead to performance savings in various cases. These are all the uh, examples I had crafted up for you today, and I hope you learned something today about how to group your objects together better, how to uh, organize your code in a smarter way, and I'll see you next time.